Good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome to this jointly hosted US Studies Center and Asia Society webinar titled A New Cold War, China, America and the Geopolitics of COVID-19. We have three great expert panelists with us today to discuss a topic that I think is extremely timely and continues to unfold day by day. The first is Richard Maud. Richard joined Asia Society Australia in January 2020 as the inaugural executive director and senior fellow of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Richard most recently served as deputy secretary, Indo-Pacific Group at DFAT, and was previously the De director general of the Office of National Assessments. Second, we have Ashley Townsend, the Director of Foreign Policy and Defence at the United States Studies Centre at the University of Sydney. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with Ashley's research and commentary on strategic affairs in the Indo-Pacific region. And third, we have Dr. Lynn Kwok joining us from Singapore. Welcome, Lynn. Lynn is the Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific Security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies and a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Cambridge. Lynn's research focus is, a, is on security and law of the Indo-Pacific, particularly the South China Sea dispute. Now onto today's topic. Even before COVID-19 uh, emerged this year, US-China relations had already entered a competitive and I think mistrustful phase. The Trump administration in its 2017 national security strategy identified China as the principal revisionist actor in the Indo-Pacific, whose actions and policies had already challenged key aspects of the US-led order. Since then, we've seen deep differences emerge between the two countries manifesting in the US side in a trade war, policies to decouple US economic interdependence with China in high technology in particular, a sharpening of rhetoric and action over the South China Sea disputes, as well as Beijing's management of the pandemic, uh, China's treatment of its Uyghur population and its enactment of a new national security law over Hong Kong. On China's side, we have seen more aggressive action in the South China Sea to, to coerce, intimidate, and prevent rival claimants, uh, states from enjoying their territorial rights. Similar aggressive action on the border with India, matched with what is commonly termed wolf warrior diplomacy. The relationship between the US and China, in sum, is characterized by deep mistrust and animosity. So relations are clearly at their lowest point uh, for many years or decades. Some are describing this as the beginning of a new Cold War. Whether this is the case or not, these fissures appear to be difficult to overcome regardless of the outcome of this year's American presidential election. With this in mind, I want to now turn to our panelists and to ask broadly, what are the drivers behind these trends? How is this competition manifesting itself? How is our region responding? And where are US-China relations headed? So I'll start now with the first opening question that I'll direct first to you, Richard, and then turn to our other panelists. So what do you think, Richard, are the factors that are driving these developments? Uh, why has the relationship between the US and China deteriorated further since COVID-19? Well, thanks, Lavina, and um, thanks very much uh, to US Study Centre for partnering with the Asia Society for this event. You know, this really is the big question of our times, certainly for um, the world and for Australian foreign policy. There's really no bigger issue than, of course, uh, how to manage the rise of China and also how to manage competition between um, China and the United States. And you could, you could say, Levina, that some degree of competition is the inevitable result of great powers um, competing, but I think that misses some important points. So, 
just a couple of thoughts from me. One, uh, the pandemic has certainly accelerated US-China differences and they've added even more heat into a very difficult relationship. But it's important, I think, for us to remember that um, America's falling out with China has been quite long in the making. It predates President Trump. Uh, it, it encompasses both the Republican and Democratic parties, even if they differ in part about what to do about China. And it also encompasses much of the US business community. And there's a, there is a long answer to your question, a very long one, but the short answer to your question is that the US sees the old model of dealing with China as broken and no longer serving US interests. So that was, of course, a model of engagement and managing differences and often managing differences down in the hope of cooperation on global challenges and also uh, of change and reform in China. And the US now sees itself gripped, I think not just in competition with another big power, as I said, but with a much more authoritarian and ideological China uh, that often breaks commitments and seeks unilateral advantage in order to sustain the party's grip on power. And I think it's really interesting to listen to what uh, the leading foreign policy thinkers on both sides of the political in the US say about the kind of relationship they want now with China. They use words very often like more balanced, fair and reciprocal. And those words are really important because they define what the US see seeks. And in seeking those objectives, the Trump administration is much more willing to push back against China's behavior. It's much more willing to use sticks rather than carrots. And you mentioned a lot of those sticks. And it's much more willing to tolerate a higher degree of friction uh, in the relationship. Indeed, if you have a look at the administration's recent public document on its China strategy, one of its um, explicit aims is, and I'm quoting here, is to compel, compel Beijing to cease or reduce actions harmful to the United States national interest. So this really is a fundamental shift in US thinking about the balance and of cost and benefit in the relationship. Um, and that drives a lot of those actions that we've seen on IP theft, on the cantalous trade and investment policies, on cyber, on technology, uh, on, on media. Uh, my fellow panelists and I were joking that there's an announcement, you know, every day at the moment uh, on many of these issues on the South China Sea just in the last couple of days uh, or so. And, you know, I think clearly there's more to come. Now, I'm going to stop here, Lavina, and let other panellists have a go. But obviously, all of this does raise some big questions. I think one of which is, will sticks have any greater success than carrots in changing China's behaviour? What are the risks of the current strategy? And also, would things be any different under a democratic administration? Well, thanks, Richard. Um, Ashley, what are your thoughts? I mean, Richard is mentioned that it's a, a long-term trajectory, that it's not, I mean, we can expect to some extent that this is structural, that any time you have a rising great power and it meets an existing great power, there's going to be friction. Um, but we're, we're seeing that it's deteriorating quite a lot in a very short space of time. And I'm, I'm interested in your view and also um, on, in, in a sense, is one side more at fault than the other? Um, maybe we can try and talk about that early on. Thank, thanks, Lavina. And, uh, and again, uh, let me just express my thanks to the Asia Society for co-hosting this, um, this great event with us and to you, Lynn, and IISS for supporting as well. Um, <clears throat> look, maybe, maybe I might make three points to get rolling. And, and first is on, on the immediacy of the uptick in, in, in acrimony and in competition and in um, a cycle of escalation that is faster than many of us can keep up with. Um, I don't think it was preordained that the Trump administration, or certainly an, an, an alternative US administration, but even the Trump administration had to approach uh, COVID-19 from the lens of accelerating competition, nor did Beijing. They were choices that were made, and I think it's important to note that they were choices that were made um, with a lot of momentum behind them, as, as Richard um, laid out, uh, but also choices that were made in many respects, um, irrespective of the concerns and interests of many other countries across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it's certainly the case that all of us um, 
have a stake in US-China coordination in global and regional coordination when it comes to COVID-19. And so it's at least conceivable that there were opportunities early on for China to be more transparent, uh, for the United States to use less um, in, you know, sort of inflammatory rhetoric in characterizing China's initial response for the two sides to find off ramps as they tried um, on a couple of occasions earlier in the year and uh, but ultimately haven't pursued uh, and that, that, that we would have all been worse, uh, better off for that sort of relationship and for that sort of compromise in responding to what is ultimately a shared challenge, one that none of us have experienced before and one which will require um, engagement and coordination with all countries, including the US and China, with respective regional friends, partners and allies. Uh, so that's the first point. And so I think reflecting on why that didn't happen is really interesting. And I think that goes to, to the second and longer term point. Uh, Richard's laid out very well, I think, that the US-China antagonism is both structural as well as something which has had its origins in administrations both in the Hu Jintao administration as well as in um, the Obama administration and earlier and wasn't a, just a product of the Trump administration. I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding about that. What I think changed in the Trump administration is that there was a removal of the political filter uh, that often constrained the kinds of public commentary and policy positions um, that, that officials or leaders in the United States system would and could take. And by that, I mean, if you had conversations with the Asia hands in the State Department during the Obama administration, or indeed uh, <clears throat> with folks in the Pentagon, uh, going back even earlier than that, you would have encountered um, a very similar strand in thinking about the kind of, uh, of threat that China posed to US interests in the Indo-Pacific, both in a military sense, as well as in uh, the sense of, let's say, a sphere of influence sense. Um, but many of those views were restrained and calibrated by political um, uh, control at the senior levels, control that didn't want the relationship to get out of hand, uh, control that was motivated not by a sense of, of defeatism or capitulationism or anything like that, which is often how it's characterized retrospectively, but out of a concern to manage stability um, in a very important relationship to manage all of the equities that the US has with China. Richard mentioned the business community, which at, at least until recently, although it's, it's changed over time, but at least until you know the last five years, still wasn't persuaded of the kind of turn that we're seeing now in the US system. And so you had this, this restraining factor that the Trump administration largely removed. And I think that was a product in many ways of key personalities in that administration. Um, and of course, of the president's own views on this and the president's own willingness um, to play a brinksmanship in international politics. So I think, you know, people matter, choices could have been there. This administration has both adopted people and choices that have been less concerned by stability and by maintaining that, um, that, um, th that relationship in check. I think a point to note here is, is why and, and if we leave the president aside for a moment, it is the case that the United States public really wasn't that concerned about China as a strategic competitor until the last administration, until the last four years. Uh, if you look at public polling going back through the Obama years and even in the start of the Trump administration, China ranked very low in threat perceptions and is creeping up now. Um, and if it is the case that uh, there was a consensus forming over a decade, really, at the elite level, that China was a competitor that needed to be responded to by the United States, and that that would need to mobilize resources and change bureaucratic patterns of behavior in order to focus attention on that challenge, then you see part of the domestic political logic taking a more uh, strident, uh, in many cases, assertive stand rhetorically in characterizing that relationship and removing that political filter. So I think that that's one of the drivers of that relationship. Lavina, that doesn't get to your third point, which is about um, blame. Uh, and I don't think that that's necessarily one that we can answer. And I think the reasons for that, are that we can go back to any point on the calendar in the last 30 years, uh, until it's to the mid 90s, uh, I would say, um, at least, and, and point to uh, tit-for-tat cycles between the US and China uh, that have 
blown out over time. Um, one of the ones that's most often pointed to is the way that China has modernized its military since the mid 90s, when it became um, acutely aware of the way that the United States capacity to wage you know, precision strike warfare um, uh, 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 against competitors or at least against smaller states in Europe and the Middle East could well be mobilized against it in a Taiwan Straits contingency and has methodically set about doing something about that. I think the real question uh, that's interesting for us to answer is why has it taken so long for the United States to respond to that kind of challenge? And noting that it has taken so long, I think the urgency with responding and shifting policy settings quickly in part is why we've uh, seen and experienced a bit of whiplash in this administration. Oh, Looks like Lavina, uh, you might have frozen. Lynn, I can see you haven't frozen and I know she was coming to you. So why don't we just turn to you and keep the conversation rolling? Sure, um, thank you so much. Um, I'd just like to, Lavina, we've just... Um, you lost me to come back again, sorry. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, Thank you. <laughs> first of all, let me start off by uh, thanking the US Studies Centre as well as um, the Asia Society Australia for the invitation to join in this discussion today. I think your Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, recently said that, you know, the region is becoming, or the world is becoming poorer, uh, more dangerous and uh, disorderly. And if that's the case, I think Australia is very fortunate to have scholars like you uh, to be looking and thinking about these issues. Um, I'm very grateful to be part of the conversation today. So thank you for having me on. Um, in response to the question of, you know, what, so, why the relations um, between you know, the United States and China are deteriorating, I think, um, as, you know, has been said by um, Richard and Ashley, you know, these uh, COVID-19 was merely the accelerant of an already deteriorating relationship. Um, I think uh, what is happening, I'll state my argument up front and then kind of elaborate on it, is that relations have become so bad uh, because increasingly we are seeing uh, US goals come onto the horizon, which are fundamentally inconsistent with Chinese goals that have always been on the horizon, even though they may not have acted been acted upon. So if we look at the various disputes, um, if there's an important dispute, there's a US-China uh, element to it currently. So basically, whether it's trade or technology or the South China Sea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, there's this US-China angle to all of this. Um, and it's, in a sense, these are because these are disputes that are important and just the number and the scope of these uh, arguments are enough to increase tension in any relationship. But I think it's more fundamental than that. These disputes in, are in a sense, uh, the symptoms rather than the cause of this breakdown between the United States and China, um, which has at its heart, I think, um, a deep strategic distrust of the other party um, and a fundamental anxiety about the other party's anxieties. Now we've seen that in the United States, um, which has in various policy documents uh, labeled China as its main strategic competitor, the 2017 national security uh, strategy, the 2018 national defense strategy, the 2019 um, report on Ch the Chinese military. Um, and I think if we look at all of these, um, we see an increasing sense um, of concern over China as a dangerous player. And while US goals were initially unclear, I think what seems to be clearer by its words and rhetoric, even though the United States might not be aware of it themselves, is that it's, move, it's even moving beyond what Richard mentioned uh, earlier about um, you know, seeking a more balanced, fair, and reciprocal relationship with China. I think at its root, the United States is worried about China surpassing it uh, in the region, and it's hoping to block that. Um, China, on its part, I think, has always had a belief that the United States uh, seeks to constrain its rise and wants to continue with its regional hegemony. Um, 
I think the Trump administration's actions have largely reinforced those views, but these views have been present, I, I would suggest, for decades. If we look at the 1996-1997 Taiwan Strait crisis, I think it, if you look at northern history, it might have begun there, and followed by the 1999 US bombing of the Chinese embassy in Serbia, you know, George W. Bush's labeling of China, China as a strategic competitor in 2001, followed by the EP3, uh, EP3 incident um, in 2001, uh, where uh, US signals intelligence uh, aircraft collided with a Chinese fighter aircraft uh, near Hainan Island. And then Hillary Clinton's uh, throwing the United States hat in the ring in the South China Sea by, um, by stating that the United States has interests in the freedom of navigation, open access to Asia's maritime commons, and respect for international law in the South China Sea. Now, China is likely, as I mentioned earlier, always to have excluding the United States um, from its what it considers its sphere of influence. Um, but I think what changed in recent years has been the fact that now it considers uh, the or in recent years it's considered the United the challenges posed by the United States as decreased and uh, China's strengths, both economically as well as militarily, to have increased. And that's why it started taking actions most dramatically, I think, in the South China Sea with its, you know, uh, almost conjuring up overnight of, you know, huge artificial islands, which are now serving as basically military bases for uh, China. So I think in short, then, I think the, the cause of deteriorating US relations um, uh, with China is these fundamentally inconsistent goals of you know, seeking to exclude each other from what they consider their, their uh, sphere of influence um, and um, the deep distrust on both sides. Thank you. Um, I think all of you have kind of raised uh, some issues related to the, this almost conceptualization of what's going on as a new Cold War. Um, and I, I know that's part of the title of this uh, event and I wanted all of you to just consider that for a moment I mean it's quite a debate within um, international relations circles as to whether it's actually useful to think about what's emerging now as um, being apt uh, as a cold war description or whether it's actually very distinct and that we we really can't turn back time and it's not a useful analogy um, so I, I think I wanted to I, I won't go all together in the same order, but I might ask Richard first to give Lynn a break and then I'll come back to you, Lynn. Um, Richard, what do you think about that? Sure, yeah, thanks, Lavinia. Well, it, it's certainly true that the historians and the policy wonks and the strategists are working themselves up to have a big fight about whether or not we should use that term. And at some point, of course, that, that becomes a bit pointless. Uh, and so we should be careful not to get lost in that debate. I do think it's an imperfect analogy. I don't think this is a rerun of the Russia-US uh, Cold War. I do think there are some big differences. Um, you know, one is, for example, that the US and the Chinese economies are deeply entang <clears throat> entangled. And even though I think we are going to see some partial decoupling uh, in some areas, particularly technology, obviously, um, I don't see any grand decoupling of um, their economies. I think that's, that's a fantasy. And I don't think really that um, American business wants that at all. I, I also think that the contest with China is a much more multipolar one uh, and will increasingly be so uh, into the future. It's not just about um, China and America. It's also about uh, Japan and India, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Australia, and even Europe, of course, uh, where there's, uh, you know, a re- uh, invigorated debate about how to manage uh, the differences with China. I think whatever you call it, there are some things we should clear about. Um, one is that the competition is multifaceted. So it's economic, it's technological, it's strategic. It does have uh, a quite strong ideological component to it. Uh, and it's also global in its dimension. So uh, whatever you call it, um, it is uh, a very big challenge for us all to manage. Uh, and, it, and built into it, of course, are some, are some clear risks uh, that all, we also need to do our best to manage. Okay. Uh, Lynn, what, what do you think? Um, is the Cold War analogy 
an apt one, or as Richard has pointed out, there's some really quite important differences? Well, I think the limits uh, to the term Cold War uh, are, are, are quite clear to me, um, and some of them have been highlighted as well to, to Richard. But let me say this. It is a Cold War that we're now embarking upon between the United States and China in the sense that it is a heightened state of geopolitical, geopolitical competition between the two great powers that's short of a kinetic or a hot war. So in that very limited respect, we are entering um, a Cold War. And I think uh, there was a concession of that without perhaps those same words by uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, in a statement, I think it was last week, when he talked about relations being at the worst point between the United States and China uh, since uh, they re-established uh, ties um, four, uh, four, four decades ago. So yes, Cold War, because it's not a hot, hot war. But I think, like Richard, I find the analogy very um, not terribly helpful. Um, analogies are usually meant for clarification and to make an argument of sorts. Um, I, I, I find it the, the debate around it rather confused and confusing. Um, if the argument is that the United States will ultimately prevail um, in this uh, fight against China, as it did in the Cold War, then I think um, this argument's clearly stretching it because as Richard mentioned, there are clear distinctions between what happened during that Cold War and what's happening today. Um, the first difference that comes to everyone's mind, of course, and that was already mentioned, is that you know the US and uh, Chinese economies are far, far more in integrated. Um, you can decouple in some areas, but not across the board without huge costs. And I think this point is significant because, um, yes, there can be decoupling across, across a wide arena of um, issues, but this is going to hurt the United States as much, possibly even more than the United uh, and then the, uh, than China. So, in this respect, both parties, if they sought to decouple their economies, they are going to be cut, cutting off their noses to spite their faces. So, you know, that's not going to work. Uh, the second difference, I think, in my view, that's significant is that China is economically much stronger than the Soviet Union was during uh, the Cold War. Um, so. It is the second largest economy in the world. And in terms of purchasing power parity, that China surpassed the United States in 2014. While COVID-19, I think, will hurt China's growth trajectory, I think all signs are that it's likely to also be hurting the United States and its allies um, as much, if not more. The third reason I think that this uh, analogy uh, is flawed is that the countries over which China and the United States and its allies seek influence um, over today are quite different from, uh, they're, in a quite, they're in quite a different position from the position during the Cold War. So they are not easily going to be swayed to fall in line between blocks. They are resisting, as, we, as we've seen, um, having to make a choice between the United States and China. So quite a different set of scenarios. And I think quite apart from be, the Cold War analogy not being terribly analytically useful, I think it's, it might also be dangerous insofar as it overemphasizes the role of ideology in this fight between the United States and China. Um, I think ideology has a fairly limited uh, role to play, uh, has had a fairly limited role so far, insofar as it influences threat perceptions on both sides. But I don't think China, thus far at least, is seeking to actively export its Leninist ideology. And there's frankly very little appetite in the region uh, for this. I think countries are attracted by the China model simply because it's, it's, it's an economic power and um, they're interested in its economic offerings. Now, if the United States starts becoming too evangelical about democracy and about political regimes, and I see signs of that happening, then what we might see is first, we might see further di uh, divisions entrenched between the United States and China, making the relationship even more intractable and causing even more instability. And second, I don't think it works well for the United States because it, it might limit 
a number of partners that the United States can usefully work with. Because if you think about it, very few countries in the world, not very few, but you know, the vast majority of countries in the world are not liberal, not countries in the world are not, uh, especially in the region, are not liberal uh, democracies. Um, and this will in turn leave a vacuum for China uh, to play a, play into influ influence these countries. And I think this could result in the very result that um, uh, proponents of a more ideological stance um, are seeking, namely the reversal of democratic gains in the region. So for those three reasons, namely deepening divisions, limiting partnerships, as well as possibly having the unintended consequence of reversing democratic gains in the region by opening um, the strategic uh, field to China, I think we need to avoid um, uh, casting the debate so much as an ideological debate, I think, uh, the ideological battle. And I think that Cold War illusions um, actually militate against this, um, are, are not helpful in this respect. Okay, and, and Ashley, um, turning to you, maybe this is a little bit of a segue to a, another question I wanted to ask about wolf warrior diplomacy. So Lynn's raised, and, and both Richard and Lynn have raised some very important points about differences between what happened in the Cold War and what's happening now. Um, but I, I wanted to maybe ask you a little bit about the idea of ideology um, and uh, the role of ideology. Um, you know, there are some that would, would argue that that it is actually about the, the differences in ideology and political system um, that might have been driving what's going on now. Um, and when you look at some aspects of wolf warrior diplomacy that we see uh, emerging this year, um, some aspect of that is also about saying that the Chinese system is a better system in dealing with pandemics, um, things that require um, control of, of population in a, the most efficient way. Um, what, what do you think about that, about the, that role of, of kind of a promoting the political system of the Chinese uh, government, uh, as well as whether wolf warrior diplomacy, what, what's driving this wolf warrior diplomacy? Is it about insecurity or is it about actually propelling some strategic interests? Um, I'll, I'll leave that to you. Thanks, Lavina. Um, let me make one very quick point about the Cold War, and, and I'll come to that question. And that's simply to say, I, I agree with, with, uh, with Richard, Richard and Lynn um, that the characterization is imperfect. I would go one step further and say that the challenge that we have in dealing with China is much harder than the challenge in many ways that the US and Europe and the world had in dealing with the Soviet Union for two reasons. And one of those is that the Soviet Union was granted a sphere of influence at the end of the Second World War. What we are witnessing in the Indo-Pacific is a China that's seeking to acquire a sphere of influence uh, and countries like Australia, Japan, India, the United States, others in the region to a greater or lesser degree are trying to do more to stop that than they have previously. Um, but the power imbalance um, that that presents us and the lack of coordination because of a clear organizing principle of ideology um, that that presents us makes it a harder challenge. That coupled with Richard points that this is a multipolar competition, um, I think um, uh, could be read, it could be interpreted in two ways. On the one hand, there's more actors than the US and China, there are more balances out there. But the flip side of that is the US organized, if you like, the Cold War uh, response, in part because it possessed 60% of world GDP at the time. Uh, now it possesses 20% of world GDP. And so um, the equities and decision making and the preferences of regional countries, which are not aligned in as uniform a way, uh, all need to be taken into account to a much greater degree in order to organize a similar response. I think that's a good segue to the, to the role of ideology, because again, um, uh, you know, although we could, we could quibble at this and, and, and should at the margins, by and large, there was a clear ideological framework for organizing um, the US, Soviet, you know, US or Western Eastern competition during the Cold War um, that is lacking today. I share Lynn's point, uh, Lynn's view rather, that um, uh, an increasingly um, uh, ideological and um, political systems focus by um, the US or, or any countries 
that are US allies um, has, you know, has very clear risks attached to it um, because of the way that countries are both unable to, even if they wanted to adopt that similar position because of their dependencies in other domains on China in ways that are not going to be decoupled or because the nature of their regime, uh, it, of, the, of the regime, the third party regime itself is not a democracy and is yet a strategically useful uh, country for the US to be pursuing greater alignment within the region. And so for those two reasons, um, just for starters, ideology is not going to be the organizing principle. But we are seeing um, the US adopt a more ideological framework, at least in rhetoric. Uh, I think the new White House a China strategy is a very good example of that, as are speeches made by Mike Pence, um, Pompeo recently, the Secretary of State, um, that also play on the importance of uh, you know, US values, the championing of, of values, freedom and openness, uh, respect for sovereignty and non-interference, all of these things which of course are easy to agree with, but not necessarily the lens with which it is the most effective way to galvanize alignment patterns in the region. The wolf warrior diplomacy side of the spectrum, if you like, is, is a sort of more aggressive um, um, uh, and, and maybe more ham-fisted in a way mirror image um, by China seeking to aggressively uh, portray its system as better in handling the pandemic response uh, may in some technical senses have some merit, but obviously doesn't overcome the, the, the heart of the issue, which is that they hid from world um, uh, scrutiny, um, the initial outbreak and responses to it. Uh, so it's a fairly thin uh, platform to stand on. But beyond that, where wolf warrior diplomacy has moved from just defending the Chinese system, which if you like, was the bread and butter of Chinese propaganda for, for many years when it came to these sorts of you know, big global issues, um, it's moved from that to actually trying to criticize other countries to sow dissent within them, uh, to sow uncertainty about what's actually happened, criticizing French responses to the pandemic, accusing French nurses of taking racist stances, inflaming rhetoric in different countries through Europe, through the region, um, 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 when it comes to the, uh, the, 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 the validity of those statements, using a lot of false narratives um, that are actually patently untrue and have been shown to be so with regards to the origin of COVID-19 being a US Marine Corps um, 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 uh, visit to China earlier in the year or late last year rather, when it comes to the way that countries have responded, there is a lot of misinformation out there. I think a lot of that has um, uh, been strategically motivated, but has not succeeded. It's been strategically motivated because it, in addition to just trying to defend and, and advance their position as a state that is more competent in dealing with this for the attendant effects that that would have, it's also been motivated, at least in the Australian case, to try to split Australia or to sow doubt around uh, the reasons for uh, Australia's um, own efforts to stand up a COVID-19 inquiry to sow doubt around that particular policy priority, which is not in Beijing's interests, and also to try and split us from the United States in, in finding common positions. That splitting of allies has been a key objective of Chinese propaganda and carries through into mm -hmm. wolf warrior diplomacy. Now, Richard, what, what is your take on um, the objectives of this wolf warrior diplomacy? Do you do you see some clear objectives? Uh, I know Ashley's answer was very comprehensive. Uh, I'm not sure how much room he's left you. Um, but do you think it's actually achieving those objectives or in fact detracting from what China might be seeking to achieve? Well, um, from an, I think from where, when we look at out, out on the world, it looks pretty counterproductive. In fact, it looks mostly almost entirely counterproductive and of course, a lot of people, even people who watch China closely, have been scratching their heads about this. How can it be in China's long-term interest to so alienate um, so many of its partners? I mean, they've, they've even managed to alienate parts of Europe, and that really takes some doing. So, and you, you know, there is a little bit of a debate, as much as you can have a debate in China these days about this. There are a few brave voices who've said, well, what is going on here? And it's, it is actually really hard to know why. Uh, some people who know China very well, you know, essentially say it's about um, uh, perception of uh, not 
not being seen at home in China to be backing down, uh, that China has to take the fight uh, on this issue to the world and that China is now powerful enough um, to do so. Um, and look, that's quite a plausible explanation. Another one might be that um, the system that Xi Jinping built is pretty rigid these days. And you know, when a general instruction comes down to uh, be more aggressive in your diplomacy, which is actually what um, the Chinese foreign ministry was instructed to do, um, you know, everybody really gets the instruction. And so they're all out there uh, going their hardest and seeing what um, ambas their fellow ambassadors are doing around the world. But the short answer is, uh, I think it's been highly counterproductive uh, for them. I'm going to give you two cents of, on ideology, though. Okay. Uh, we, shouldn't get we shouldn't get lost in this either, but it is a, it's a fantastic, uh, important subject. I think Lin is right that um, China is not really trying to export its model, model of governance. I don't think it really expects its neighbours to become, uh, you know, to, to create communist parties and run themselves like China. But I do think ideology uh, is really a really important uh, part of the problem we have um, with China at the moment for a couple of reasons. One is the party now places this enormous emphasis on ideological security and purity. And they see this as the key to preserving the party within China. Um, and of course, now that has an, an enormous extraterritorial reach to it. And this is one of the big rub points um, in the relationship. The misinformation campaigns, the foreign interference, the reaching into countries like Australia and America to uh, sh try and shape the debate, to control the narrative, to influence Chinese communities, overseas Chinese communities. And this is, a, this is a, undeniably one of the big friction points we have um, with China at the moment. And so the second point about ideology is, while China doesn't really expect the world to become like it, it's certainly interested in reshaping parts of the global system so that it's more accommodative of China's interests and its form of government. I'm going to, I could go on a lot, but I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lynn, I'm, I'm going to bring in, you in there, um, not necessarily to talk about war warrior diplomacy, but I'm, I'm actually interested in talking a little bit about the region and bringing in your expertise about the region. Uh, part of that is wolf warrior diplomacy and what effect that is having, because we, we see that China is also pressuring a lot of Southeast Asian countries to be very grateful um, for the, their health, uh, I guess, equipment and any assistance that they're giving. So it's uh, the, the flip side to the, the more coercive aspects of wolf warrior diplomacy is also that, again, what you just said, Richard, that construction of the narrative about, you know, this is why... China in the region is a good thing, and here here is a concrete example of of what China can can do for these smaller countries. Um, I also wanted to bring in more generally. So we're talking about U.S. China and how it's playing out in the region and affecting the strategies uh, of Indo-Pacific countries, particularly Southeast Asia. Um, and I've got a, a question from um, John Lee in the audience listening, um, and he asked. Uh, I think an important question about hedging strategies. So we know that Southeast Asian countries um, have a, a hedging strategy when it comes to the US and China. They want to benefit from both countries and they don't want to be forced to choose. And he has asked here um, that Southeast Asian countries um, often argue that they shouldn't be forced to choose whilst in the meantime, countries like the Quad countries uh, making their own arrangements. They're taking active steps to counter um, some of the more adverse aspects of Chinese policies. And has this fence sitting been detrimental to both ASEAN and the ability of Southeast Asian states to shape the agenda? Um, what's your view on, on how this is playing out? Thank you. Um, let me address uh, those questions in turn. So. Um, the effectiveness of wolf warrior diplomacy uh, in Southeast Asia. I think I would broadly agree with what Ashley and Richard have said, namely that, you know, it's been counterproductive. Um, it's been rather obnoxious and off-putting, um, but I don't think that, you know, the, 
the region necessarily or the international audience was necess uh, was the target of Chinese um, world war and diplomacy. It was a domestic message um, meant to uh, assert the primacy of uh, China's or the efficiency of China's response over others. Um, that said, um, I don't. Well, it wasn't helpful. I don't think it's going to have long lasting negative implications, at least in Southeast Asia. I think it's a blip in the ocean. Uh, countries in the region are going to be making their uh, decisions uh, based on determinations of national interests. Um, and as off putting as, as Chinese diplomacy might have been through the COVID 19 crisis, um, that's probably not going to factor in. Uh, dramatically into their decision-making process. I think they're going to be looking at broader factors. So how China behaves in the South China Sea and elsewhere. So you know, how it behaves in Hong Kong, how it behaves in Taiwan. These are all imp uh, important factors that the region will be looking uh, to factor in, um, looking at. Um, so, and the second factor I think they will be looking at is um, the United States and its uh, ability, uh, its reliability as an ally and partner um, as well as its ability to frame uh, the frame the issue as one that is about, as Ashley mentioned earlier, earlier about defending a free and open Pacific. So values based, um, not necessarily democracy, but the values of you know the rule of law, the importance of the rule of law, freedom of navigation, the peaceful resolution of disputes. So can the United States frame that as? Um, what's at stake as opposed to an anti-China coalition. And I think the third factor that they'll be looking at is uh, the ability of the United States and middle powers like Japan, importantly Australia as well, uh, to offer uh, alternatives to or complements to the Belt and Road Initiative, because particularly after COVID, uh, countries in the region are, be, are going to be looking to rebuild. Uh, they're going to be looking to develop and infrastructure is going to be critical as, um, and health infrastructure is going to be critical in this respect. And I think we should all be noting that uh, Xi Jinping has already talked up a health silk road. So I think as you know, countries like Japan and Australia think about how to move forward into in terms of uh, shaping uh, the region, uh, you know, the importance of the health sector and securing health supplies, etc. That needs to be seriously looked into. Japan, Australia, the United States, they have a trilateral partnership, um, trilateral partnership infrastructure investment agreement or something. I can't remember the exact title, but, you know, I, I don't, I haven't seen very much movement in that respect and urgent attention needs to be uh, cast in that direction. Um, so Lynn, do you, just to clarify from you, do you do you see that there's really not, you can't really see that any particular Southeast Asian state has shifted its position in terms of hedging? Um, it isn't looking at either country, the United States or China differently in a significant way, or it's still in play? That's not what, that's um, not exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that wolf warrior diplomacy as a factor I don't think it's going to be significant in terms of the long-term strategic development of the country. Um, what I think it are going to be factors are the factors I just outlined, namely, you know, how China behaves, how the United States behaves, and you know, the ability to offer up material alternatives to um, the Belt and Road. So I think those are the more important issues that we need to be looking at. That said, um, I think it's absolutely right um, what John Lee mentioned, and thank you, John, for that question about, you know. South Chinese, uh, South Southeast Asian countries continuing uh, to hedge, um, and I think while they continue to hedge, I think what we might, what we have, at least my reading of it, that is though many might not agree, is that within this hedging strategy, I think there has been a slight tilt towards China, and I think China uh, and COVID, I think. Uh, would have exacerb uh, would have enhanced that slight tilt towards China. So an increasing tilt towards China within the broader hedging strategy of seeking good relations between the United States um, and China. And why do I say that? First, I think you know countries are looking uh, will be looking to rebuild their economies. So countries even before COVID nineteen were looking. Uh, towards China's Belt and Road Initiative with great interest, even though they might have disagreed on some onerous terms. And, you know, uh, 
uh, wary of China's intentions, but by and large, they welcome BRI projects, which might be economically viable and add something to their economy. And these are the more um, enlightened uh, governments in the region as opposed to, to the more corrupt ones who welcome it anyway, because it, it, it you know, helps to line their pockets. So um, I think we will definitely see you know, countries like Cambodia and Laos continue to lean on, uh, on China, given their close, uh, the, the closest of the two economies. But if we look at countries like Indonesia, for instance, Indonesia went to China uh, offering up $91 billion worth of uh, uh, infra infrastructure projects pre-COVID-19. Post-COVID-19, we've seen um, where we've seen Indonesia already during COVID-19 suffer the worst mortality rates, it could suffer a whole lot more. So post-COVID-19, I expect it to seek to enhance um, economic uh, ties with China further, despite uh, problems in the security realm. So despite its you know, overlapping claims, uh, overlapping EE, uh, maritime claims. Uh, Malaysia as well, the current Malaysian government you know, lacks legitimacy, there's plenty of infighting and Prior even to COVID, you know, it's, it, Malaysia's economy was struggling. We're going to see this government, which already had close ties with China prior to May uh, 2018 when it lost power. We're going to see this government seek to enhance uh, ties with uh, China because it's already working very closely with China in terms of a COVID response. So I think there's this tilt definitely uh, towards China, at least with some countries in Southeast Asia. As for whether or not uh, Southeast Asia's failure to take sides actually hurts its ability to shape the region. So thank you again, John, for that, that question. Um, I, I think it does to a certain extent. And I think that they are trying to uh, get more into the game of shaping developments in the region. And, and we saw that attempt with its um, issuance of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific in the summer of 2019. Um, that sought to, you know, reference the Indo-Pacific, so actually use Indo-Pacific terminology, which of course the United States and its allies are prefer, while at the same time, you know, mentioning the importance of infrastructure development to, in, in the region. It didn't talk about the Quad, but it did talk about, um, which, which of course China does not like, but it did talk about um, uh, the importance of economic integration and connectivity in the region. It tried to reassert ASEAN centrality and the importance of, you know, uh, international law and the rules-based order. So it, it sought to balance, um, even as it sought to um, uh, give its view, its outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So it's trying to stay in the game um, by, I think, trying to shape the Indo-Pacific strategy or vision as something that is about you know, the importance of the rule of law, the rules-based order, et cetera, as opposed to something that is about containing China or take, seeks to uh, take sides. But I think ultimately um, uh, the proof will be in the pudding as to whether or not it is able to uh, shape developments because it's not only words that matter, but actions as well. And I think the true test, the ultimate test will be in whether or not, you know, ASEAN and its member states will be willing to perhaps pay a price uh, to ensure uh, that the rules that they uh, hold dear are maintained um, so that in the long term, even though they might suffer some short term economic consequences, they are put on a more stable foundation for future economic growth and stability. Thanks, Lynn. I think this, um, we've, we've got about five minutes, I think, left. So I want to bring in Richard and Ashley. Um, we, we really need to also talk about Australia and how Australia fits in with this uh, in, you know, growing competition between the US and China. And I wanted to ask if you, either of you would like to leave some con concluding thoughts. Um, I think what Lynn just raised about uh, the fact that Southeast Asian countries might be in fact tilting towards China or there's opportunities for China to capitalize on weaknesses that will definitely emerge from COVID-19. Um, what do you think in terms of how Australia should best advance its interests amid this growing competition. Um, could I ask Richard first to, to give your thoughts and then I'll ask Ashley next. Thanks, Lavina. <clears throat> so there's a few things uh, that we are already doing uh, because Australian policy, of course, has evolved quite a lot in recent years and that we should keep, keep doing. Uh, and there's probably a couple of things that we're not doing that we might think about. Um, and really, we've got a kind of three-part policy. One is that we're hardening ourselves domestically against some particular threats to security and sovereignty that China poses. So you see that in 5G, foreign investment, uh, 
uh, cyber and so on. And we're just gonna have to keep doing that even though China doesn't like it because those threats are real and they're significant enough that we just can't simply ignore them. Second, we have to keep working with other countries in the region, not, uh, not to contain China, that would be folly, but to balance its power in the region and help support the resilience and sovereignty of key partners who are feeling um, the same kind of pressure. And I think our goal here is accepting that China's influence is going to grow uh, in the region. We can live with that. What we don't want is a region that has a might is right culture or a Beijing centric regional order in which countries are forced to defer to China's interests and authority. I think we've got a reasonable chance um, to achieve that. Uh, you know, I accept what Lin is saying about um, the economic lure of China, particularly for Southeast Asia and the reluctance to choose. But equally, you know, I see a, a reluctance to choose as, as really being about wanting to stay in the middle. And we're also seeing, I think, greater signs of a loose coalition of countries in the Indo-Pacific who want to work together to balance um, China's power. And then the third thing, <clears throat> we have to work very hard um, on both China and Washington. For an Australian perspective, we have to be clear that the relationship uh, is not going to work on the terms that China currently is seeking to set. We've got to pick our fights carefully, but be prepared to pay an economic cost when it's important enough. But we shouldn't close off opportunities for working with China where there are benefits to this. And then on the US, we, have, we don't have time for this, but you know there are some risks and problems with the current uh, US strategy, even though it's responding to behaviours that really do damage its interests. And so what we want is to encourage the US to respond to China's challenge in a proportionate way. There have to be enough off ramps and flexibility in its strategy to de-escalate. And we really need to find some space for the US and China to continue to be able to work together on big global challenges that really matter, like climate change. And Ashley, probably two minutes. Thanks, Lavina. I will be very brief. Um, look, I, I mean, I, I agree with, with the points Richard just made. I'll make two brief ones. First is, I think, um, when it comes to accepting a degree of cost, as Lynn said, um, if we are to move from hedging to doing something about the predicament, Australia has in many ways led the way there over the last few years. Richard just alluded to that. Um, and I don't think that that is something that is going to shift Quickly, we've paid a cost for our response to um, disinformation recently. We've paid a cost to our response to stand up for something that was, uh, if you like, order reinforcing, that is to say the COVID-19 inquiry. Those are calculated costs made at very senior levels and I think um, uh, should also signal to the region um, that uh, there is in, in Australia a, 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 a willingness um, to not only um, uh, seek to, in words to preserve a regional order, but to actually undertake deeds, including with others that will help to reinforce that. That's the second point. We've just had the defense update released um, a fortnight ago. And the first part of that, and probably the under emphasized part of that in terms of its reporting, is the shaping role for Australian uh, defense diplomacy in the Australian Defense Department. Uh, shaping uh, the region in, in ways that will be conducive to finding those balances, um, those common interests, those situations of strength um, that help regional countries to help themselves, to the regional countries that are on the front line of Chinese coercion, to help them ensure their sovereignty, um, uh, share intelligence, partner with them in defense sense, partner more broadly in a capacity building sense when it comes to institutional resilience, counter foreign interference, et cetera, legislation, those sorts, of, those sorts of things. They are the work agenda for not just Australia, but for the US, for Japan, for others in the region. It's already underway. And I think it's only through doing that that you will be in a position where um, the nature of the, the, the regional strategic environment will be still conducive to the interests and, and values that we hold most dear. Well, thank you. Um, Lynn, did you want to, uh, I think we've got no time actually, <laughs> um, but if, if there's anything you want to say right at the end here um, before I close up? Well, I had several things to say, but I think I'll just leave it at one. Um, <laughs> I think we're not going to see US-China competition go away. Um, so the off-ramps that Richard talked about are highly important. Um, I think what 
should be the international community's main goal is, and, and also the regional um, uh, countries, their main goal should be twofold. Um, within the, so they, they should be looking at ensuring that competition takes place within bounds, within a wider framework, within, within which very fierce competition can actually take place safely. So one, they need to ensure that a rules-based order is maintained, defended and adhered to. And two, it needs to ensure that you know, multilateral institutions are fit for purpose so that however fierce competition is between the two great powers, we have certain checks in place. Um, and I think that in the nearer term, I think, is what we should all be looking uh, towards doing. Thank you. So I want to um, thank all of you for sharing your really great insights on this very big topic, important topic. Um, so thank you, Richard Maud, Ashley Townsend and Lynn Kwok. Um, and I now wanted to um, just briefly show um, the audience um, some important pieces of research that all of the participants in the um, panel today have recently written that you might like to look up and read further. Um, so we have a report uh, by Ashley Townsend, Brendan Thomas Noon and Matilda Stewart called Bolstering Res Resilience in the Indo-Pacific. We have um, a piece by Richard Maud, Looking Ahead, Australia and China After the Pandemic, all very relevant to what we've talked today. And on the next slide, uh, we have um, a very interesting blog by Lynn Kwok, Will COVID-19 Change the Geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific? And lastly, a paper that I've written for the Lowy Institute on um, the Quad and how the Quad might fit in uh, with the geostrategic competition between US and China. Now I'd like to turn to um, Ashley. Ashley, over to you. Oh, thanks, Davina. Thank you very much um, uh, for moderating. Great discussion today. I'll be brief here, but just a quick plug. Um, that next Wednesday, uh, the US Study Center will be running a webinar um, with those you can see on the screen, um, moderated by our CEO, Simon Jackman, uh, that will foreshadow a little bit of the discussion for the upcoming uh, US Australia Osmin consultations, and where we'll discuss the report Bolstering Resilience in the Indo Pacific that you just mentioned. And Richard? Oh. Uh, thanks, Davina. I don't know whether that slide's going to come up, but I was going to plug um, an Asia Society event. There it is. There it on is. the need for a green recovery uh, in Asia uh, with uh, one of my colleagues at the <clears throat> Australian arm of the Asia Society Policy Institute, Patrick Suckling. Um, can I thank you uh, and my fellow panellists? Uh, particularly great to have Lynn here because it's really good to have a perspective directly from the region. Also wanted to recognise we had a hell of a lot of really good questions. Uh, I was trying to type answers to some of them, but my fingers weren't fast enough. Um, uh, and the questions I think go to the complexity of the, and the importance of uh, this set of issues for Australian foreign policy. So maybe at some other point, we can come back and tease some of them more out. Thanks very much. So thank you all again, and thank you all in the audience for joining us today. I hope you found it um, really interesting um, and that you'll join us for all of those further events coming up. Um, and thanks again, Lynn, and the Asia Society and the US Study Centre.